all of us have been messengers uh, of a message for many different reasons. Even in the home, sometimes a parent will say, when your brother gets home from school, tell him this. And you're given the message to pass on. And, and uh, maybe a boss says, make sure you tell so-and-so when they come in, uh, they're going to be a little late, make sure they know this. And we pass on the message. So today, what if you were Moses and you were given this message that God speaks today? He says to Moses, Moses, go and tell all of the Israelites this message. Be holy as I am holy, because I am the Lord your God. Be holy like me. What? What a message to take to people. Be holy. When I was in the seminary, um, it was said to me once, about 50 years ago, uh, in scripture class, see, I didn't, don't speak Latin, or I took Latin, but I don't speak it, or Greek, Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, none of those languages. But my professors did. They learned them all so that they could read original texts, manuscripts. And uh, one of my professors one day said this, quoting this passage, the last line of the gospel today, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He said, there's a better truth. Now, right now, if you go on to usccb.org, I always tell you to do that. Or better yet, if you go on to Bible.com, uh, you can put in that passage, be perfect uh, as the heavenly, your Heavenly Father is perfect. And you will come up with, uh, there's at least 20 different Bibles in English. There's about 10 in Spanish. And probably in almost every language. I don't know about all the Asian languages, but... But there's many, multiple translations, and they're quite different. And going back to, like, the old English uh, King's, King James Bible, very different. But this is what my professor said. It says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He said, but a better translation of the original would say this, be perfected as your heavenly Father is perfect. And those two letters, that E-D, be perfected, make all the difference in the world. Because if you say, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, who's doing the perfecting? We are. But if you be, be perfected, somebody else is doing that perfecting in you, and we would say God. And how does that come about? Through his grace, through his love. And in fact, I, I didn't notice this before, but um, the verse before the gospel that Dennis sang said, Alleluia, Alleluia, it said, Whoever keeps the word of Christ, the love of God is truly perfected in him or her. It is perfected in him or her. So, we let God do what God does, love us and grace us and bless us, and if we're open to it, anything can happen. So he says, tell the Israelites, you be perfect as I, your Lord and God, am perfect. What a message. And then we hear in Leviticus some of what that means. Love your brothers and sisters. Don't hold grudges. Don't pay back. Lend to those who want to borrow. And Jesus is quoting a lot of these passages. Um, all of this goodness that Leviticus would ask of people. And then in the second reading, Paul says to the Corinthians, don't you know this? You are temples of the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that? God dwells in you. And I suppose that if that question were asked, especially after this reading day, you say, yeah, we know it. But what's that mean? Over there, that little box that we call the tabernacle, where we put the body of Christ in the holy bread, the bread sent from heaven, you know, there are people who would go pray before that but would dare not touch it. It doesn't matter if you do, but there are people that would say, no, no, I can't, I can't touch that. It's just too sacred. That little box, it, it, there's a sacredness about it, and we would, most Catholics would say, yeah, I believe that somehow, sacramentally, Christ is really present there. But would we say that about ourselves? Paul tells us, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, every one of you. God's love, His grace, His presence dwells in you. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And once we really believe that, that's God already perfecting us. If we really believe we're sacred, if we really believe each other is sacred, then all the other stuff follows 
So Jesus begins to quote Leviticus and says, you've heard it said, you know, you shall love your brother and hate your enemy. But what I say, what I say to you is, you should love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who hate you. What? This is not minimalism. This is maximalism. You know, the law by its nature, I think, generally speaking, is minimal. For example, when it says, Don't, do not kill. Duh. I mean, doesn't everybody know that pretty much? I know not everybody does it. There's a lot of murder goes on in the world, and, and then, of course, murderous wars where we kill thousands, if not millions of people. But, but most people instinctively know it's wrong to kill. So Jesus says, if you don't kill your brother, uh, you know, are you to be praised for that? Even pagans do that. Non-believers do that. But Jesus says, I tell you, go further. Let God perfect you. And Jesus' reasoning is made clear. He said, we're supposed to be like God, like it said in Leviticus in the first reading. God, who is good. And he says, doesn't God give his sunlight to the good and bad? So today, you're my bad people, okay? You're the sinners. You're awful. Oh, my God. An example. An example, okay? And here's all the good little saints over here. And God puts out his sunshine on everybody. The same. He doesn't say to the good people, I give you 100%. No, you guys can get about 23% today. That's all you deserve. He gives his sunlight to everybody. He gives his rain to everybody. God is love. Now, I know some of you, I know some of you believe that God's up there counting your sins today, and he's just waiting to punish you. And when you die, get ready, because you've got to do some serious time to make up for all that. I don't believe that. I, if you believe it, believe it. Don't introduce me to your God, okay? Because my God is not that. God is love. That's what John tells us, and I believe it. And God doesn't turn, God's not like us. He doesn't turn his love on and off, on and off, depending on how good we are. Uh, we've been reading for two weeks every day the story of Noah and the ark. Oh, oh I, wish that, I wish that had never been included in the Bible because I think people really mix it up. They take it seriously, literally. Now, there's no man alive who could build an ark big enough to house all that he supposedly housed two of every animal, and in some cases seven, depending on the animal and its importance, and then his family, and food for everybody, uh, and build an ark with his, his nails and hammer, whatever, in seven days? Come on, get real. Impossible. With the best of tools, you couldn't do it. And then what's this? Two of every animal, seven of some, um, animals eat each other. They attack each other. Uh, they attack man and woman. So what's he going to do? Cages for all? Well, it just doesn't make any sense. This is absurdity to the max. And then food for all of them. Oh, and then what about the ones that eat animals? You know, you eat the two that, that God said put in there to, to, so I can recreate them again, and, but they're going to get eaten unless all of them turn off their appetite. And then how long are they in that ark? For 40 days and 40 nights? Hate to be so crude, but they got to go poo-poo and pee-pee, don't they? Everybody does. So isn't that a case for diphtheria or some other disease? It's just impossible. It's an impossible, ridiculous story unless you see what it's all about. It's about God cleansing the world of sin, renewing, purifying, washing away the stuff that makes us ugly. That's what the story's about. And it's a very visual story. In fact, as a kid in Catholic school, we had Bible story books. And I remember the, the picture of Noah and the ark with all the animals and the giraffe sticking out over here and a lion over here with its mane. It's a very visual story, and, and surely it captivated. But the point of the story is what God is doing. He's perfecting and cleansing. 
And I'm sorry, but I, I, I wished it hadn't been written because in it, God decides. He makes a decision. I'm killing every human being on the earth except for Noah and his family. Wow. And then I'm going to kill all the innocent animals because they're just animals. They don't know what they're doing. I've got to kill them all. Save only two of each one and seven of some. That's a weird God. That's a weird God. I can't believe in that God. But I do believe that no matter what we do, our God loves us. He gives the sun. He gives the rain. He gives his grace and his blessing. And I think, personally, that precisely when we are in the deepest sin, that's when, not that he loves us more, but that that love has the most power potentially on us to transform, to wash me new and clean and make us new, to perfect us, to perfect us. So he says, you've heard it said, you can love your enemy, I mean love your brothers and sisters, but hate your enemy. But what I tell you, is love those who hate you. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who would kill you. And that's exactly what he does. And as I, when I lived in my black community for 12 years, I heard all their sayings, and you've heard me say this one. They always like to say, baby, she walks her talk. She walks her talk. And Jesus was somebody who walked his talk. He said these words, what I say to you is love your enemies. And what's he doing on the cross? On the cross! It'd be different if he's walking through the streets of Jerusalem and people were, or were mocking him or laughing at him or saying awful things and he blessed them. But from the cross, after all that's been done to him, they spit on him, they stripped him and beat him and they hanging him on the cross with, with thorns in his head in the shape of a, a crown to make fun of his kingdom. And, and they're mocking him as he's bleeding to death on the cross unspeakable pain. And instead of condemning them all to hell, instead of speaking nothing but hatred toward them, he blesses them. Father, forgive them all. They know not what they do. I think Jesus is being serious about this. What I say to you is do this. Let this perfect you. Let God perfect you as you begin to live like God. Be like God. Sharing the goodness of the goodness of God. Do it. Let that happen to you. But I think there's still more. And I think that Jesus um, gives us a reason to be selfish in a good way. Because I really believe that if we learn this lesson that he teaches today, if you had to pick one word that you think it would produce in you, what do you think that would be? Hello? What would that affect in you or cause you to feel, do you think, if you, if you could do that? Love even those who hate you. Bless those who hate you. One word. Anybody? I'll help you out. It starts with a P. Peace! Peace! Don't you think so? So I'm driving down the street today, and by the way, I hope you're all driving more carefully than ever. Don't trust those darn signals out there. Red doesn't mean red for some people. And almost every week I read of somebody that gets killed, the whole family's killed because some idiot drives 80 miles in a 35 and goes through a red light. They're on something or they're off something, I don't know. So uh, you watch every signal you go through. You've got to drive defensively because there's cuckoo people out there, totally cuckoo. Drive defensively. But if sometime today you're driving and you make a little tiny error and then somebody extends the longest finger on the hand to you, okay, I'll leave it at that, and it's glaring you in the face, the temptation is to respond the same. The temptation is to let it bother you. The temptation is to get angry and maybe honk or say an unpleasant word. 
But Jesus would say, why don't you bless the person? Why don't you bless them? Why don't you send a little grace and love through you to them? Maybe it won't reach them, but you'll feel better. You'll feel better. You'll feel more peaceful inside than if you allow them to take away your peace and make you angry. Let yourself become angry. On the one level, he'd say, repeating the words of Leviticus, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. You be holy. But I think he would say also, be holy, be good, because when you do it, not only will you be doing good, but you'll be finding peace.